my left is Haley Matson mathis Haley is the executive director of the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation, which is a nonprofit or organization that supports culinary education, not at, only at this post-secondary level or the community college level, but they also support culinary education at over 30 high schools now, right? And the professional cooks. And I'll have Haley speak and then introduce our guest chef. Aloha, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you from the Hawaii Culinary Foundation. As Don mentioned, our nonprofit's mission is to provide culinary education to the community colleges throughout Hawaii and also to mentor high school students who are interested in going into the culinary profession. Our whole focus is to raise the bar in culinary education and in the food industry in Hawaii. One of our board members from the, for the Hawaii Culinary Foundation who is with us today is Chef George Mavro Felicitas, Chef Mavro, and Chef Don also serves on the advisory board for the Hawaii Culinary Foundation. We're very honored to have Chef Mavro with us today. He's a passionate advocate for culinary education and has for many years uh, done culinary uh, restaurant reality experiences at his restaurant, Chef Mavro here in Hawaii and Leeward Community College students have been a participants in that program. Chef Mavro is one of the founding uh, Hawaii Regional Cuisine Chefs and also is a James Beard Award winner, which is the ultimate award uh, in the culinary industry. He was the founder of Chef Mavro Restaurant in 1998, but prior to that, he was an executive chef at the Holly Kalani and also an uh, executive chef position at the Four Seasons. Chef Mavro Restaurant uh, was in existence for 20 years uh, and uh, was known for food and wine pairing and also achieved the very distinguished Triple A Five Diamond Award. Uh, he he uh, was known for the regional cuisine they served and he partnered with his chef, Jeremy Shiga Connie, who has carried on the Chef Mavro tradition with M by Chef Mavro starting in 2019. Chef Mavro now is doing special events and uh, very intimate dinners for uh, clients. And today he's going to share his vast expertise. Um, he is from Marseille in France where he was born. And so he has um, taught many times for the foundation and we're very honored to have him with us today. Thank you, Chef. <coughs> Should we start? Okay, uh, today I'm going to do one of my classic, is a squab papillote. A pa papillote is a technique, it's very interesting because you are learning a technique of cooking that is very popular in France and I didn't see too, too many times in this country. And uh, everything is very delicate, like fish in general, and uh, uh, squab is the most delicate. You know, something else also. Squab is uh, something, I don't know, we don't, we don't find anywhere. You can go to any restaurant beside New York, maybe, and San Francisco, you don't find squab, okay? If you go to France, every single Michelin star restaurant has squab in a menu. And uh, all the three Michelin stars, they always have a combination, it's a classic, combination of squab and uh, foie gras. Why? Because squab maybe is the most delicate, delicate uh, meat you can find on the market. It's a, it's a red meat and it's totally delicious. So I, I start of course with uh, all squab and I'm going to remove uh, I'm going to remove the breast. And you can see
And you can see it's red meat. So the, the size I'm doing, I'm doing a testing, testing menu size. Basically, it's one appetizer. And uh, um, of course, uh, if you want to do this recipe as a main course, you put the whole squab inside the papillon. But now, since I put foie gras, I'm going to do appetizer size. Like testing menu with uh, five, six, six courses. This is the perfect size for six, five courses. So I'm removing the breast from the carcass. And we are going to use the carcass to do the jus. Of course, it takes two hours to do the jus. So uh, Chef Matt did the jus already before I arrived. Is, is there a use? Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so this... This can go direct. Alors, if you follow the recipe, this goes direct on the oven. You, you bake the carcass for about 20, 25 minutes at 500 degrees, and after that, you used to do the jus. Well, it takes, takes a long time. The jus is done. Yeah, can you? Yeah, sure. Okay, so when, uh, when the jus is done, you add uh, I need uh, one more like that. You add uh, some demi-glace. Thank you. Bring to a boil. And I'm going to infuse. Where is my tea? Jasmine tea. I'm going to infuse uh, the jus. When it's possible, uh, use uh, always a uh, loose tea, but uh, jasmine loose tea is not easy to find, I know that. Huh? But if you know, you use a uh, loose tea. I, ne I never use this. To me, this is not tea. But jasmine uh, takes quite a strong. Chef Mavro, what would you compare the taste of squab to? I'm sorry, can you say again? What would you compare the taste of squab to? What's the closest thing that tastes like squab? Yeah, so, um, so yeah, so beautiful. What, uh, if I cook, this is very important, very nice question. If I cook squab, I use a squab jus. If I cook duck, I use duck jus. If I cook uh, chicken, of course, chicken stock. Etc. Etc. Beef, veal, pork, very important. Lamb. You don't want to use a demi glass on a lamb. You know the bone tastes so wonderful. So every time I change the stock. Every time. Today I put a little bit demi glass because this is a very natural, natural Jew, and I want I want this uh, to be a little bit more intense. So I add the demi glass, but. Just the juice already delicious. Huh? 
But this is a finishing. Uh, and what does it taste like during the squab? I'm sorry. What does the squab taste like compared uh, to the the squab taste? Ah oh, the squab tastes like squab. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and uh, nothing else. Is why is why is so. You are going to see. I did a few. Huh? You are going to test. So why is so special? I'm sorry, I, I thought you were talking about the jus. I think it's the budget from the spinach. Very good. I did a cover, but I'm going to use this. So I infuse, I infuse the jus for now. Okay, and I'm ready to put the papillot together. So my, my uh, jasmine is infusing uh, with uh, the jus. This one I'm going to put here. This is dangerous. Okay. Okay. So, what I'm going to do? Slice uh, because I'm not uh, everything is going to happen inside the papillot. I'm not going to saute the onion, so I'm going to slice very fine the onion like that. And you know, we are when you cook, if you are not on, t on TV, it's not necessary to do a show, just cook beef with your with your. Onion, beer. you know, uh, you know when you slice uh, par parsley, it's not necessary to do that. This is very nice, but this doesn't shop anything. And when you shop, you shop that, 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 that. Very important. Huh? You have to forget a little bit the, the, the syndrome of the TV and the show. And the, you, have to, you have to know something. More I cook, less I do presentation on the plate. You understand? Of course, this doesn't mean don't do presentation anymore because we are going to get fire from your restaurant. But myself goes direct here to the plate is finished. I don't do. I don't put one single flour on my plate. I don't put a little bit red, a little bit... You're going to see this one. It's very rough, but it tastes fantastic. This is a small parenthesis. So I'm going to season. Uh, hold on. So I slice, I slice the onion very thin because I'm not going to saute. Okay. I have some already sliced. You, are, you remember uh, with the jus, it's very easy to do it. Huh? But you need a mirepoix. So you have to know what is a mirepoix. It's very important, a mirepoix, a brunoise. Huh? And when you do a mirepoix, when you do a stock, don't take your carrot like that and put a big piece of carrot on your stock. Do a mirepoix, e even size, to make sure all your celery, onion, and carrot cook at the same time. This is very important. Huh? Oh, savoy cabbage, one more time. You have, uh, it's, like, it's like a little bit squab and, uh, and Cornish game. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a squab, and, uh, and the, red, the green cabbage is a Cornish game. Which I like, I like Cornish game anyway. Okay, so this is a Savoy cabbage, what you call curved cabbage. But nothing to do with cabbage. It's more, it's more on the lettuce family almost than on the cabbage, which is a, is a cabbage anyway.
or something. Or this, the cabbage, you can slice a little bit. You can slice a little bit bigger than the onion. Cabbage, this cook very fast. Can you see? Remove the big piece like that. Alors now, foie gras. When, when you slice foie gras, you have to always to put the foie gras at room temperature. Because uh, when it's from the fridge, it's hard, and it breaks down, break down when you try to slice it. Huh? And room temperature. A room temperature is very easy, you can see. Huh? I keep this because it's precious. <laughs> it's for you. you can have fun with that. Okay. And, uh, alors, you season. You know, I was lucky enough to work with Alain Sandorens long time ago, 1,000 years ago. And uh, Alessandro Lorenz was, uh, at this time, uh, uh, a three Michelin star. He, was, uh, he, was, he came from the sous chef, uh, the chef, pardon, executive chef of uh, La Tour d'Argent to open his own restaurant. And I, work, I was working with him when he got three Michelin star. And uh, I remember when we were seasoning, you know, we were seasoning, blah, 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 blah. You used to get crazy, so you take your salt and you look at your thing and you season, make sure, you understand? And this was crazy because when you are a young kid, you say, what is he talking about? And, and uh, I still, when I season, I season the food, I don't season the cutting board. And same thing with this, then use the ground pepper, already grounded, use uh, the pepper from the meal. And same thing, look at what you are doing. Okay? Okay, we are ready for the papillote. No, it's okay. Ah, something I want to do very fast. Since I'm going to cook the squab uh, inside the papillote, I want to crisp the skin a little bit to make sure the skin, the skin doesn't come chewy or you remove it. Huh? I like to keep it, give more flavor. Huh? Huh? But I'm going to skin, to, to put the skin here. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to crisp the squab, the skin, with a little bit uh, grape seed oil. Why? You know, myself, in my, I'm from Provence, I'm from the south of France, I use uh, mostly extra virgin olive oil. And then think, then listen, when uh, somebody tells you, you cannot cook with extra virgin olive oil. It's not true. You can cook, I can, I can do French fries with uh, extra virgin olive oil. I can do masadas with extra, which is delicious. Masadas with extra virgin olive oil, fantastic. It's very expensive. But, uh, so, but this recipe with foie gras, squab, savoy cabbage, the, the extra virgin olive oil doesn't belong. This is not a recipe with extra. So I use grape seed oil. Why? 
because the grapeseed oil has a very high uh, temperature uh, that it doesn't break. You can, you can bring this to 450, it doesn't break. Huh? This is why I use this. So a little bit extra virgin oil, a uh, little bit. Uh, and I, I, I crisp the skin just a little bit. Then cook the squab over there. Yeah. Okay, papillot. Now we are ready. I have some uh, egg yolk. The egg yolk is only uh, to seal the papillote. Ah, yeah. I put a little bit grapeseed oil on the bottom of the papillot to make sure the onion doesn't attach. Again, seasoning. Don't put one ton, huh? but I season everything. Oh, for the savoy cabbage, only salt. Oh, no. Why I put the foie gras like that on the top of the savoy cabbage? Because the foie gras, when it's going to cook, it's going to release the oil. And uh, this is going to season the savoy cabbage. It's going to be fantastic. Can you see the skin is just crispy, that's all? Huh? And the squab is not cooked. Never overcook a squab. If you have a restaurant, you do squab. And if a guest say you, I would like my squab well done, you are authorized to go to the dining room and to say to the guest, please, can you eat something else, please? Because the squab well done cannot exist. No, don't do that, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> this is my dream, you know. <laughs> when a guest say, oh, I like the wagyu, well done. Ah. Yes, sir. Very good idea. What do you want to say? Huh? It's life. The squab is something like what you. So now I'm going to seal. I don't know the time. The timing is good. I'm going to seal the papillote. The oven is OK. Huh? Oven 500 is OK. Huh?
So you fold your parchment paper like that. Usually, uh, I always put uh, just in case because if you, uh, the papillot uh, open, this uh, doesn't work. Huh? So I, I, I put clips. Really, you don't have to do it. Uh, it's just uh, extra precaution. Okay, now two reasons. Number one, I'm going to raise a, I'm going to raise a papillot on a, on a frying pan. We, again, we will need a bit of uh, grape seed oil. Oh, this has two purposes. Number one is to start the papillot, to start the, the balloon. And uh, number two is to cook the onion. Uh, but don't burn the paper. Goes very fast. So on a recipe I put, uh, it depends, you know. On a recipe I put a uh, uh, bake at 450. Uh, it depends on the over, your oven. Uh, this one, 500 is uh, very high, should be maybe 450. But if you cook this at home, not on a professional, put 500. And this I put 500. But instead, instead of 10 minutes, I put six minutes. Can you see? Huh? Six minutes. Smell like jasmine already. Chef, can I ask you a question from one of the students? Yeah. Uh, student asked if uh, you were going to put squab in a multi-course, maybe a five or six um, dish a menu, multi-course. Yeah. Uh, what other dishes would you put in that, in that uh, five-course menu? Yeah, excellent, excellent. Good. So let's say, let's say simple, okay? You start with uh, one appetizer, okay? And uh, you might have uh, one demi-fish dish, after the appetizer, huh? uh, let's say the appetizer is scallop, uh, a classic scallop, uh, fish is a snapper, whatever. Huh? And after that, you have the squab. And after the squab, you can have uh, either a venison, which will be very nice, or beef, uh, or, or you stop at the squab and you go to the dessert. The four, four courses right. is nice. Also. Or you could maybe have a cheese course. Uh -huh. Yeah. But 
At the restaurant, I used to have nine courses. Yes. E even, even, even more. I went to 12. I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> it's over. No, you know, you do, you know, you do because people ask for. And you say, oh, I want to try everything. So you want to try everything? 12 courses, okay? 14 courses. And it's okay, but it's simple. So so you know, why don't you want to do that anymore? Why do you prefer to do less? Because I, I get, when I go to, like uh, in France or even in New York or in San Francisco or uh, when, uh, in California, I go to a three Michelin star. And uh, I, I have uh, 12 courses menu. I have some I dam, I get very frustrated because it's so delicious. I want more, you understand? <laughs> so you cannot have everything. It's a nice way to test everything, huh? especially if you go only once in your life. Like if you go to the French Landry right. and you go once in your life, get the grand degustation because you have a, a, the whole picture. Uh, I didn't, six minutes, huh? you, you look at, <laughs> you, are, you, are, you, are, you have the whole picture. But if you go to, if you are very rich and you go to the French Landry every week, don't take the grand degustation. Take uh, one appetizer, one main course, one dessert, and this is wonderful. I agree because also when I eat nine or 12 courses, afterwards when I go away, I don't remember each of them as well. Oh yeah, you get confused. Huh? But it's a, it's a nice way. Sometimes uh, sometimes it's a bit of chef ego, you know? Yeah. So I'm going to, do, to show you what I do. Well, <laughs> you are to eat, huh? Yes. Sometimes the chef, you go, and never mind. Are you understand? Yes. Are we okay? Alors, hold on. Something very important, I have to go. When you take the, pa six minutes almost, huh? Yeah. When you take the papillote from the oven, you have to spike the paper with a knife. If no, what is going to happen? The papillote is going to deflate. And when you arrive, because this is a, you is the table side, you come to the dining room with your own papillot. So you don't want the papillot to be deflated. It doesn't change the taste. Huh? Almost? Yeah, one minute. OK, very good. Oh, this is a, is two way to do it. Yeah. Usually it's table side. So the, way, the waiter takes the papillot uh, from the kitchen, bring to the table, hold on, I have to go. Yeah, yeah, go, go, take it. Hold on. Remove me. Yeah, very good. Of course, uh, remove the clips. And the waiter is going to open the papier. Oh, this you have, you have the smell, which is wonder, wonderful. I used to do a kumu, kumu papillot with a basil. So when you open, people say, wow, you open the, the smell of the basil and, uh, and the seafood.
Is it Jasmine Jus? Oh, this is just the jus. Huh? There's no butter, no, just the jus. Et voilà. Thank you. And it's not difficult. But yeah, you, have, you, have, you have to know the technique of the papillote. If you know, you burn it. <laughs> and you can see the foie gras gives the jus. The foie gras gives the jus inside the cabbage. Chef, a uh, student wants to know, what is the best advice that you got when you were a young chef? Or that you can maybe part give to? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you are talking about. Uh, <laughs> When I start, you know, I remember, well, I have so much stories, I mean. I remember, I was with uh, Trois Gros again in Rohan, a three Michelin star, in the center of the, of the, and it's a very, you know, I came, I, I remember the year before I was with Alain Sandorens, who was very crazy, nouvelle cuisine. One day, I, I, one day, Alan, Alan Sandorin told me, I wonder if salt and pepper, which is, he was crazy about seasoning. And one day he told me, I wonder if the salt and pepper is not a perfection of the taste. And uh, so, okay, all this experience. So I was with Trois Gros, and uh, I, I was talking to Pierre Trois Gros, and uh, trying, you know, to show off a little bit about the, one of my recipes, and uh, suddenly I realized that I was talking with Trois Gros. So I said, uh, sorry, sir, <laughs> sorry, chef, I apologize, I mean, I don't know, I, want, I don't want to show off, I apologize. And Tro Trois Gros told me something very important to answer to your question. He told me, if you don't think yourself you are the best chef in the world, you are not going to put on your plate anything as have good, you understand? So, you are, this means, don't think you are the best chef in the, in the world because the <laughs> the, even if you think, if you think it's good, if you believe it, you are in trouble. And, uh, but you have to be confident of yourself. You have to say, oh my God, you have, it? No, you have to, you have to go and be confident and also, Advisor, your job is very serious. It's not just a job. Huh? Look at me at my age, I'm still, when I talk about uh, cooking, I get crazy. It's not just, it's not just a job. Huh? And uh, so when you cook, when you cook in Hawaii, sometimes uh, you don't have a three mission star in Hawaii, and, you, and the restaurant are doing a great job, thing. Great. Every restaurant is doing a great job. The restaurants are doing this kind of job. It's maybe two, one, two, three. Okay? So you might find yourself uh, somewhere you are making a sandwich instead of to, to do a squab with foie gras. Even a, a sandwich, you have to put everything on your sandwich. You have, you have to, to do your, your sandwich like uh, if uh, you're your life, be, a, be a, you know, your life is in jeopardy. You are, and this is very important. Whatever you do, put your best inside. And you know what? You put your best, and sometimes it's even not enough. You know, in my kitchen, sometimes we had a lot of stag, uh, stagiaires from CIA in New York. And they were coming, and uh, we put them uh, cutting carrot all day. And, uh, and we were never happy. The carrot is, you call, you call this a brunoise? You have a big piece like that, a small piece like that. This is not a brunoise. 
And, uh, and the guy said, I do my best. Your best is not enough, you know, sometimes. So you have to work very hard. And something also, your job is very serious. You know, an executive chef in a hotel, maybe uh, in uh, New York, on a big hotel, can make uh, $200,000 or $250,000 a year. Do you know an engineer or even sometimes a doctor or a specialist make $250,000 a year? No. So your job can be a career, can be a very big job, and you can make big money. So take this seriously. Go to school, graduate from school, work very hard, and if one day you succeed, you are going to have a nice career. <laughs> um, what is the most challenging ingredient that you've worked with, or that you do work with? Yeah. Squab is squab. one. It's very easy to overcook squab. I hope we, we wait a little bit, I hope this one is not overcooked. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, I take risk, huh? It's very easy to have a cook squab. It's beautiful. Yeah, perfect. This is perfect. Oh, okay, challenging. Challenging also, one more time, for rice challenging. Uh, it's a lot of uh, uh, ingredients, like high-end ingredients, uh, are very uh, challenging to cook. And, uh, and they are very expensive. Don't screw up this. Is a, is a very expensive piece of meat. Don't screw it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. huh? This also, foie gras also, very, exp very expensive. But like, uh, what is very challenging is to do a risotto. Do you think, oh, risotto is rice? Yeah. Or like uh, uh, local sticky rice. Yeah. How many times I order rice in a restaurant, is overcooked or is a He's crunchy. How many times? And he's a local boy. But learn how to do. <laughs> learn how to do rice. And it's not that easy. You understand? It's not that easy. And uh, you, know, you put in a rice cooker, well, maybe it's not the best way to do it. I don't think it's the best way to do it. Huh? And so, even if you cook rice, it has to be perfection. Not crunchy and not pudding. What is, um, what is your, what, where or what is your favorite thing to eat in France? I'm sorry? Where or what is your favorite thing to eat in France? Like, what, what is something you would go back and just want to eat when you went back to France? Uh, very, I go back to France every year. I will, I will be in Europe. If it's possible, I will be in France in April this year. And I was in France in, uh, when the pandemic started, just came back last year uh, you know. so i go back uh, every year and uh, i don't go i don't go to trimission star anymore i don't go number one number one uh, to go to trimission star uh, is about 500 dollars per person i don't have this kind of money <laughs> so never mind good excuse <laughs> number two i'm looking for very traditional recipe I, I, can, I can get crazy with a Burgundy beef when it's, when it's done in Burgundy or in Lyon. You know, I can get crazy uh, with a uh, uh, fry and andouillette. And uh, and you know, and uh, uh, traditional. I can get, you know, bouillabaisse can be fantastic if you have the bouillabaisse on the south, not in Paris. Don't go, don't eat a bouillabaisse in Paris. Go to the south, to Marseille. So basically go to the different regions and eat the regional exactly. dishes. Exactly, Region, regional food. Mm -hmm. Like uh, you, go to, uh, you go to the south, you eat fish. You go to Nice, you eat soca, which is a uh, chickpeas, uh, uh, crepe, you know, etc., etc. Every region. You know, sometimes people say, well, but you know what? I don't like uh, uh, French cooking. I get upset when I hear that. Uh, what kind of fresh, French cooking you don't like? Seriously, it's more difference with the cooking from the south, 
between the stuff and Alsace than the cooking from the stuff in China. I think the cuisine from the south of France is closer than the cuisine of, from China, than, than Alsace, which is both delicious. I love Alsace food. Huh? So, like in China, I don't like Chinese food. Which one? Cantonese? Yuan? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you have so many different uh, chi uh, Chinese food. Yeah. And it's totally different. The same, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Yeah. What, what do you cook for yourself at home? I cook very... Alors, I, cook, I cook at home 100%. I'm a, a chef. Usually a chef never cook at home. I do. 100%. And I cook always classic, never nouvelle cuisine, never molecular. You know, I work on molecular for about 15 years in my, in my life. I, I never work molecular. <laughs> in a, it doesn't make sense. So I cook always very classic, and I cook uh, whatever, chicken, uh, beef. Uh, I, uh, but you know what I cook? Yeah. I cook, uh, I cook every day. I cook uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I enjoy it. Yeah, I enjoy it very much. <laughs> um, could you tell us a little bit about the customer service at Chez Mavro? Like for a fine dining restaurant such as that? Oh, this also is a, is a different story. On a traditional... Sometimes people say, how come Chef Mavro is so expensive? I, I have... A, I, I, yeah. I have to tell you something. I'm not expensive enough by far. By far. You understand? Okay. Number one, if you take a traditional restaurant, I don't, I don't mention anybody. Huh? If you take a traditional restaurant, one waiter is responsible for sometimes 30 people in the dining room. So he has a section, he's 30 people. A chef Mavro, one waiter, two waiters are responsible for eight people. Or can you see the difference? One waiter for 30, 40 people, and one, two waiters for eight. Yeah. This is the kind of service. So, I mean, you, you don't want to ask for water. You don't, wa you don't want to ask the sommelier to pour the wine. You, it has to be natural and not too much. Don't suffocate the guest. You know, sometimes you go to a restaurant, or sometimes you go, I go to a nice, very nice restaurant, and they, they know me, and they, they come every five minutes. Oh, Chef Mavro, everything was on there. Everything was done. Give me a break. Let me eat. Hey, hey come on, guys. Huh? So, nice, very attentive. You have to be ahead of every uh, need of the table, mm -hmm. but don't be too much. Um, do you have any last advice for our students? What kind it, of advice? Um, for their success. For? Secret, secret to success as a chef. I think you kind of covered it earlier. Yeah, I, I, did, I did already. Um, I, I did already, but uh, I repeat. Uh, believe in yourself and take your job seriously. And uh, go to school, graduate, uh, and have to look for a job, or at the same time, fine. But don't, don't say, don't go to find a job and say, oh, you know, I went to school and I was not feeling, I many times I heard that. I'm not, I was not learning anything, and uh, it's why I quit. Uh, oh, you know what, you can quit now. Okay, you know what I mean? This, go to school, learn as much as possible, and after that, have a job on the side, this is very good because you have the practice and the theory, but learn. take the advantage to learn. Because when you work on a professional kitchen, we don't have time to tell you to, how to cook the vegetable, how to clean a squab. To, we don't have time. How to, to clean your cutting board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, as, a, as to have a, your, what kind of knife. Uh, and we don't want you to cut yourself also. You understand? <laughs> so, number one, yeah, this is embarrassing. It happened. It happened to me. It happened to everybody. 
but not every five minutes. You understand? Huh? So if you cut, so, so learn how to handle your knives. And, and have a knife cut like a knife, not like a spoon also. Huh? So be, be ready with the equipment. Huh? And, uh, and this is the, this is the advice, go to school. Okay. Thank you, Chef Mavro. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Chef. Thank you.